All right, thanks for joining me tonight, everybody. My name is Ken Rosenthal. I'm a park naturalist at Gulf Branch Nature Center, even though I'm not there right now. Uh, and tonight we're going to talk about moths. So happy National Moth Week. I don't know how all of you chose to celebrate, but this is how I chose to celebrate. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and we are going to get started. There we go. Is everybody seeing a big, pretty white and black moth? Yes. Fantastic. <laughs> Thanks. I just need at least one person to tell me and make sure it worked. Um, all right. So uh, today we're going to talk about moths. It's National Moth Week. Um, well, just to start with a, a small personal story. The oops. There we go. This was a moth that got me started. This is a carpenter worm moth, uh, and I discovered it on the back deck at uh, the nature center I worked at prior to this position uh, here in Arlington. Um, and I had no idea what it was. And you can see I got right down on my belly and took some pictures of it. Um, and I remember looking it up uh, and was really surprised to find out this was a moth because I had always thought, I always kind of dismissed them and thought they were kind of boring and drab. Um, and I remember investing in a moth field guide at that point because I thought, hey, I'd like to, you know, if I'm going to see some moths, I'd like to know what I'm looking at. Uh, and I and I haven't looked back. I uh, usually do a uh, a nighttime campfire with a, a sheet and light trap to get moths to come in and have families out. And you know, we look at moths after doing campfire and some s'mores, and I wasn't able to schedule that this year. So I'm hoping to spread some uh, moth love with my program tonight. Um, uh, as many of you who have um, been with me on several of these know, I like to kind of set our uh, position within the big tree of life. Um, so moths are animals. Uh, I think we can hopefully all agree on that. Uh, and specifically, they are invertebrates. They don't have a, a backbone uh, and they are arthropods. They have jointed uh, appendages and an exoskeleton. Uh, and since they have six legs and three main body parts, they are also insects. Um, within insects, um, I always got to go through my kingdom final class order within. Uh oh. Teams jumped up on top of my there we go. Um, class order and within insects, uh, they are uh, an order that is known as Lepidoptera uh, Lepidopterans, and that is our butterflies and moths. <clears throat> Lepidoptera means uh, scale wing. It's I think it's Lepidos and Teron uh, or Lepis and Teron are the actual the bases there. Greek. Why are you doing that? I didn't touch anything. Oh, you know what? Let me try something. There, see if that'll help me. And that happened before. Um, so scale wings, and you can see we got four different images here with different um, magnifications of those scales on the wings. If you've ever handled a moth, if you ever handled a butterfly, and you look down, you can see you get the little, you get a little fuzz or a little, um, what looks like a little fuzz or powder on your fingers. Those are actually their scales. Uh, that can actually benefit the the butterfly or the moth if they're grabbed by uh, a bird. It can make them a little slippery uh, and enable them to get out of the the beak of the bird or even another predator's grasp. Um, those scales on their wings are what give them th their really vibrant colors. You know that allow them to camouflage, allow them uh, to mimic other insects that are, are dangerous or distasteful or, or stinging, uh, and so. Uh, these scales are are really important and they cover the wings uh, on some species. You also find them on uh, possibly the head, the thorax, the abdomen, uh, or even some of the legs. Um, but um, definitely, obviously, uh, very prevalent on the wings. So moths and butterflies look like they obviously share a very similar life history uh, because they belong in the same group um, and they can easily be confused. So we're going to go through real quick the, the four life stages. I think most people are familiar with this. This is one of the um, the first insects that often get studied, you know, all the way back in elementary school. And, and I think most people are really familiar with the four stages, but it, it never hurts to, to revisit that really quick. Um, they used to call them complete and incomplete metamorphosis. Uh, this being complete, the four stages. Um, holometabolism, I think, is the more preferred word now, which I, I 
it's nice and big and lots of syllables and all like that. Um, but again, it, it's complete metamorphosis. You start out um, as most things with an egg. Uh, on the left, I, I got um, the uh, you know one here with a I got the a moth life cycle on the right uh, and a butterfly life cycle on the left. Uh, and you can see right you know right away this difference at least. Um, the Catalpa Sphinx moth obviously laid just a, a cluster of eggs and try to lay them a bunch in, in all these different positions. Where here on the on the uh, on the left, you can see the tiger squelter is one solitary. Hopefully, you can see my arrow there on one solitary little egg on that leaf, um, as opposed to the big cluster of all the uh, eggs from the Sphinx moth on the right. Um, and there, I I I want to think that that's um, definitely a strategy as well as is you have so many young in one spot so that. Um, they can disperse and they don't all get eaten at the same time. So on the left, you've got the Eastern Tiger Swalter. This is a really big caterpillar and, and being on that screen um, and how large that caterpillar was when I saw it, I think it uh, was actually heading up to pupate, which is the next life cycle. We'll get that in a second. You can see though, it, it looks almost snake-like. You got these kind of fake eyes here, or eye spots to help uh, give up that, give that image and maybe uh, hopefully trick a predator too. Uh, on the right of the Catalpa Sphinx moss, you can see there's a, a little bit of di um, of um, different colors there, a little bit of diversity in, in the, the morphology and, and the different colors. Uh, and they also have these little spikes on the back end. You can't really see them from this picture, um, but they're really neat. We have a Catalpa tree next to the pond at um, at Gulf Branch Nature Center, uh, and we see the, that this life cycle play out every year, and it's always uh, a lot of fun. Uh, not for the catalpa tree. The catalpa tree usually gets completely uh, defoliated. Um, I think caterpillar diversity can be really interesting too, and, and sometimes it's overlooked. Um, certainly, it can help you to know what species there. Like, um, and again, see here. This is a. I think this is um, one of our fall wilbur moths. Notice it's on the. It's on a building. It's not on a tree. This is on a, a finished piece of wood. <clears throat> When you find a caterpillar like that, instead of in situ, like these these are on leaves or are uh, in a plant, that usually means they've moved off of their host plant and they're trying to find a, a safe place to metamorphose. And some of these might as well, uh, but that's usually, you know, when you find caterpillars on paths or on pavement, um, they may have fallen from a tree, but they're also, they might have been moved off their host plant uh, and started looking for uh, a safe place to pupate into an adult. Um, some really interesting one, this is a saddleback caterpillar in the upper left. Uh, in the middle, this is a funerary dagger moth, uh, but the caterpillar is often called a paddle caterpillar because of these structures sticking out of each of the segments. Uh, I've only ever seen this once. It was absolutely awesome. Just really, really neat and interesting caterpillar. Um, this is a milkweed tussock moth caterpillar, uh, which again is very, um, uh, very definitive. And, and I think that coloration, much like the monarch coloration is, is meant as a warning. You can see there's a little milkweed beetle uh, out, slightly out of focus behind it on the milkweed, and, you know, and you've got that um, same coloration as the monarch, the browns and the oranges, and meant to be a warning coloration. It says, "Hey, I'm eating milkweed, so I've I've got some toxins inside my body." Um, this is the uh, one of the ten caterpillars. I think this is the uh, eastern ten caterpillar, um, and they, you know, aggregate in in large groups, and they um, have a net uh, a tent which they'll hang out in as a safety place, and then move out. Uh, I think later in the day or at night to to feed and they come back in um, and the more this um, the bigger they get and the more they eat, the more fresh you'll also find. So uh, that will um, can be a clue to the density of, of what's been living in there or uh, or not. And obviously you can find these that are empty too and it's just full of frass and that means that they've all moved on and, and, and went to find a, a place to pupate because they don't stay in there to pupate once they've um, filled up with uh, the amount of nutrition they need to metamorphose, they move on out. Uh, and then this is one of the Sphinx moth caterpillars right here, um, which is really beauty, beautiful and I was really excited. And I think like in the next two days, it ended up covered in um, um, cocoons from a, a parasitic wasp. So I don't think this one actually made it, but they are uh, can be really large and uh, dramatic and really pretty caterpillars. Uh, and you can find field guides that are just dedicated to caterpillars. Uh, so caterpillar diversity can be really uh, interesting and fun uh, to see as well. Obviously, um, caterpillars aren't always easy to find when they're on the move. It's a little easier to find them, but you know they spend a lot of time hiding. They're under leaves. They're uh, on the on the, the underside of plants. They're not trying to be out and, and seen because they have a job to do, which is eat and eat and eat, so that they can get to the point where they've had enough. They've got enough uh, nutrition and energy so they can metamorphose into an adult. So speaking of which, move on to the pupa. 
Uh, this is an eastern tiger squall tail um, uh, chrysalis on the left, and you can see this this little, little um, for lack of a better way to describe it, water uh, pile of material. This is actually the last um, uh, exoskeleton molt of the the caterpillar. Caterpillars do molt to get larger. They're still covered with an exoskeleton, so they will still molt. Uh, and so this was the molt uh, when the caterpillar went into its its pupa. And you can't see it with this picture, but there are actually strings on either side of it. Uh, and I don't know if it's one string all the way around or if it's a string on each side, uh, but holding it in almost like, um, you know, like a little rope that's holding this upright against the wall that it was that it pupated on. Um, and if you want to see one of these up close, uh, we currently have a black swallowtail um, in a pupa with that with the thread very, very, very similar in its um, structure and color uh, at the Nature Center right now uh, that one of our, our camping groups found on uh, the hiking trail and they brought in and we uh, fed it some parsley and got it to pupate. So we're excited to see the that butterfly when it hatches. Uh, and this is a Catalpa Sphinx moth. You can see it's just it's very, very grub like it's very different in, in um, uh, its shape. And this was in the the soil underneath our catalpa tree. Um, and uh, many moths will actually, you know, do a silken cocoon as well. I think this chrysalis on the left is um, probably one of the most famous because it's a it's a uh, it's pretty striking, you know, the, the green color and it's obviously uh, a monarch uh, caterpillar chrysalis and or monarch butterfly chrysalis. And uh, it's something that people are very familiar with because monarchs tend to be you know, if you ask somebody about butterflies, one of the first ones they usually know is our monarchs because they are, uh, for lack of a better way of putting it, they have a really good press agent, um, but they are um, one that are, that are talked about very often and people are very familiar with. Uh, this one in the middle, I have no idea who was in that cocoon, but I can tell you they probably didn't hatch because you get this um, wasp here parasitizing it, and that wasp was uh, definitely stinging and poking around in there and trying to find whatever... Um, um, uh, caterpillar was in there or a developing adult uh, and to parasitize it, sting it, you know, stick um, probably some eggs in it and, and, and paralyze it and hopefully its eggs would then hatch and eat that uh, and they would come out of the cocoon instead of the uh, the actual maker of the cocoon, that uh, caterpillar. And I think here on the right, this was one of the, um, I think this is one of the tiger moths. This was a really big one. This is a, a metal band. This was the inside of a trash can. Uh, when I worked in Reston, uh, and I could see the spikes on this, the caterpillar that was in there, so I could tell it was a really big caterpillar, uh, and never, never got back to see who came out. Eventually found it, and it was empty, uh, but never got to see who had um, emerged out of there, but hopefully they did okay. Uh, the, the, the really important thing you can see here, like this one's suspended from a branch. When they come out, they're going to be all folded up, and they need space for their wings to unfurl, so the, the tough thing about, you know, putting your cocoon or chrysalis, and I'm speaking like I have experience with this and obviously I don't, but the tough thing for finding a, a proper place is to make sure that wherever you uh, emerge from your cocoon or your chrysalis, you got to have space for your wings to properly fold out completely um, so that they can unfurl and, and be wide and, and space and, and properly functional. If you had any chance of um, catching the cicadas emerging this year, you know, one of the one of the biggest issues I saw was the so many of the cicadas would come out of the ground, climb up a tree, and then some of them didn't choose a very good spot to emerge out of their uh, exoskeleton and give themselves enough space for their body and their wings to to properly spread um, spread out. Uh, so that is really really important as well. And then of course, um, oh oh, almost forgot. These are both um, bagworms. These are very different types and. I know I'll talk about this one more later. And I, I think I might as well, uh, but this is Psyche, P-S-Y-C-H-E. Uh, I think it's Psyche Casta, which is pretty common around here. It's a small species of bagworm. Uh, the female um, makes this little structure out of these pieces of, of, of either grass or small sticks. This is a really common structure. If you look around, you know, if you keep this in mind and, and keep an eye out for it, um, I'm pretty sure you'll find it. I've seen this on uh, both on long branch and on golf branch and different structures. I've seen it around my house and, and on the on the siding in several places and, and certainly in some of the plants. Um, it's it's a fairly common uh, moth. It's nocturnal. I, I've never seen one of these active, but I've definitely seen the structure um, you know, many, many times. And then this is an evergreen bagworm moth. I'll talk more about them in a little bit, but they are also um, uh, fairly common. Uh, a little more choosy about where they uh, have their nest, but uh, there's a lot of different, lot of different kinds of of conifers and evergreens. You can see them on. I, I've had a pretty um, 
easy time of finding these on um, a couple of the, I think, cedars at uh, on the Maryland side of Great Falls. If you go to the tavern there and uh, walk down the towpath and go out to the Great Falls Observation Tower, I think when you cross the first bridge over um, the, some of the river and the rapids, there's a, a cedar on the opposite side and it's always got you know, a couple dozen of these hanging off of the ends of the uh, the branches. So this is something I think you, you can find really easy if you're looking for it. Uh, and of course, we got our adults. Eventually they emerge. Here's our Eastern Tiger Swallowtail, our Virginia State Insect. Uh, and this big, beautiful sphinx moth is the Catalpa Sphinx Moth. As I mentioned, they often defoliate our tree. Um, our, our Catalpa tree last summer, our Catalpa had no leaves on it whatsoever. And at that point, there were caterpillars all over everywhere underneath spreading out to either try to find a new Catalpa or to go, um, you know, pupate and hope that they had enough energy and enough um, uh, nutrition that they could uh, metamorphose into an adult. Uh, if I remember correctly, um, I don't know if it was, the, I don't think it was the first pesticide application, but I think it was the first uh, aerial spraying of a pesticide. Uh, was accomplished at a Catalpa farm in the state of Ohio uh, in the early 20th century. Um, I want to think it was in the 20s. I, I can't remember, but it was the these sphinx moth caterpillars that they were trying to get rid of off of a uh, a farm that was specifically growing Catalpa trees, and they had a problem. And they um, rigged up a sprayer on a you know on a biplane and flew it out over um, where these uh, Catalpas were uh, and sprayed them. I hope I remember it was a plane, maybe it was a balloon, but it was definitely if I like I said, if I remember correctly, it was a it was some kind of first. And I think it was the first aerial application, meaning they actually flew the pesticide over the trees and sprayed it and it was successful. It was also something I think that had lead in it, it sounded really super healthy that you didn't want to be anywhere near uh, while they were spraying it. Um, so I often get asked this question, moth or butterfly. So we're going to try to answer it uh, as best we can here over the next few slides. Uh, moths tend to have uh, a thick body, often very fuzzy. I always thought this was one of the cuddliest moths I've ever seen. Just looks like a plush toy uh, with feathers sticking out of its head and wings. Um, a smaller butterfly still has a little bit of hair, but not nearly uh, as, as hairy or as fuzzy as the body here. And it's a much, uh, much more slender uh, and thin body on this butterfly. Another thing that can often help is when you're looking at those antenna, Moth antenna tend to be feathery, uh, lots of branches that helps them pick up um, scents and signals. Um, uh, butterflies tend to have long straight uh, antennae with clubs on the end. Um, skippers are a really thick bodied, uh, more stubby butterfly, and they have very pronounced clubs on the end of their antenna, which is a good way to distinguish them from all the other butterflies also. Uh, and nocturnal versus diurnal. Moths tend to be nocturnal. Butterflies tend to be uh, Moths tend to be nocturnal, but butterflies tend to be diurnal. Um, I, my uncle's fond of saying that uh, animals don't read the books. You know, so you you can say all these things, you can throw these out there. There's always a few exceptions. There's always ones that, that go against the grain. Uh, and moths are no exception. Uh, this is a, I think it's a snowberry clear wing. It's one of the sphinx moths. I mentioned that obviously the Catalpa sphinx moth earlier. Uh, but these are um, a species of moths that are active during the day and feed from flowers in the daylight. This here is a squash vine borer moth, uh, which ironically is in the clearwing moth family. Um, so I mentioned this was a clearwing, but it's actually one of the sphinx moths. This is a, a, a moth that's actually in the clearwing family. They're both um, diurnal and tend to be active and looking for food and uh, places to lay their eggs uh, during the day. Um, now this is this is this is one here. Well, we're we're, we're going to start uh, taking exception to some of these ideas from the past. Um, one of the things that I've always felt people, you know, thought of with moths is they're they're dull, they're they're brown or they're gray. They're not very colorful because they come out at night. Uh, versus butterflies, which have these really bright, beautiful colors. And, it, and it's true, a lot of butterflies can be very pretty. Uh, on the left is, uh, whoops, what keeps happening? Why am I losing my screen here. I think I got lazy fingers and they keep hitting the touchpad. Sorry about that. Um, so the one on the left is, is some kind of, a, I believe, a dagger moth. The one on the right is a red spotted purple, um, which red and purple sounds really nice, but the colors are a little far from that. Um, but if you look at moths, you're going to find a lot of moths that have some pretty colors.
Those are so beautiful, Ken. Yeah, it's I like I said, I always keep an eye out for moths, and I'll show you where I found some later in, in places you can look for them. Um, but I, I always get super excited when I find a new moth because they're just the patterns are are brilliant. Uh, I'm gonna try to remember some of the names of these. Um, obviously, I, hopefully, I think most people are familiar with the the Luna moth in the upper left. It's one of our um, uh, giant silkworm moths, and it's very pretty. Uh, and you know when you see them, it's it's pretty cool because they don't they're not around for very long when they're adults. This is a climbing moth, C L Y M E N E. Uh, it's one of the, I think there's several of these species. Um, and I thought that was really striking color as well. This is a rosy maple moth. Uh, this one here, it's a little the color's a little dull because it was shady that day. It's not as bright as it could be. Uh, but this is a, also another yellow and pink moth. This is a, a chickweed geometer. Uh, I think this is a striped army worm. Uh, if I remember correctly, this black and white moth here, the second down on the right, is called the Hebrew. Um, there's, it, if you get a chance to look through some of these moth uh, books, the the names that they have for some of them are fantastic. Um, I want to think this is a is this an orange patch dust smoky moth. Um, that doesn't sound right, but there's there's a couple that have these nice orange patches on their shoulders. Uh, I think this was a spring moth. This is I don't remember it. I do remember. Uh, the way I searched for this moth and figured out what it was uh, eventually, which obviously I can't remember now, is I Googled moth looks like Nemo, meaning Nemo from the the, the kids movie Finding Nemo, the clownfish. I think I actually I think what I looked up was moth looks like clownfish. Uh, and this was the second or third picture that showed up in the uh, or the species was the second or third picture showed up in the image search. And it was great. I felt really um smart and Mr. Outside of the box uh, finding that. Uh, and there's a couple that have these these bright orange colors. Um, I don't remember that one either. This one's called the Herald. This is another one of my favorites as far as names. It's a really, um, I, you know, it doesn't look as bright uh, a reddish orange as you'll see it um, in real life. It's a, it's a really pretty moth. Um, I think this is a Dolica. Oh, I'm blanking on some of these, um, but this is another one you'll see there because there's two uh, that look very similar, but and it's the 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 color of the fringe that will help separate which one it is. I think one's a clover worm. Um, this one here, this bright yellow one, this is another one. Um, this is probably I think one I found shortly after um, finding that carpenter worm when I started. Um, that really got me into moss. I was like these are these are really pretty. Um, and this is one of the uh, this is either a uh, crocus geometer or false crocus geometer. Uh, and the only way to tell the difference between the two. Um, is to actually dissect the genitalia, and since I'm not really into that, um, I just leave it at the genus. Um, and so it is a uh, xanthotype, X-A-N-T-H-O-T-Y-P-E species. Um, and without that um, little bit of dissection, you can't really tell. One of the, the moth books I have gives you a description between the two, but uh, everywhere else I've read online says you can't really tell them without dissecting. Uh, doing some dissection on the specimens. Uh, this is a yellow shouldered slug moth, I believe. This is an Ilanthus webworm moth. This is um, one of the moths. The first time I saw it, I didn't think it was a moth. I assumed it was a beetle or some other kind of bug. Um, and it took me a long while to find, to identify it because I couldn't figure out. Uh, I needed to start with it being a moth and it, and it took me a while to get to that point. Um, there's a whole family of emeralds, these really bright green moths that are really, really pretty. And I always get... Uh, another one I always get excited to see and find. Um, this is, I can't remember if this is a polyphemus moth. It's another one of the, the big Saturn uh, or the big silk moths uh, that you can see as well. Um, no, I don't remember the name for this one either, but it is one of the um, uh, moths that's really good that you'll find. Just They'll fly by you and, you and you're trying to find it and it goes in a leaf litter and poof, just disappears right in front of your eyes. The really, really, really good camouflage. I think this is... Um, of the laugher again some of the really cool names well you know what sorry this guy here in the bottom right this is the herald that red and the white spots the one over here the bottom the second down on the the left column there that is uh white dotted prominent i got those backwards that's a white dotted prominent and this one in the bottom right is the herald and, and again that's another name i just absolutely adore i really like that name uh for a moth um, and again, some butterflies can also appear drab. This is a question mark. You can see the little question mark uh, symbol right there on, on, on the hind wing. Uh, and when they sit like this with their wings uh, above them and folded up, 
the bright orange and black pattern that's on the upper side of them is, is hidden uh, and they look like you know a dead leaf and that's it's one way that they can um, um, uh, camouflage themselves and again this is something there this is another one of those you know butterflies and moths that'll fly by and you're like oh that's really bright and then they land in a tree and they land and go right in this pose and you're like where do they go because you're still looking for that orange and black and that bright color and, and it's missing and so um there that's another fun one that when you can actually find it um it was really fun this i took this picture i think at dyke marsh um a lot of almost all these moths and butterflies that i'm showing you in this um this powerpoint are ones from uh northern virginia maybe maryland but all within our region easily able to find within our region um and then here's a here's another one uh wings rest on the side typically for moths this is a tulip tree beauty uh and this is a great spangled frittle area on the right uh and the wings rest together and upright for butterflies but again moths just don't read the books and so you'll find some really interesting poses for uh a lot of the moths you'll find around here Yeah, um, this is Schlager's fruitworm moth, uh, which also incidentally looks like bird droppings. Uh, this is one of the tussock moths. Uh, third one over is one of the plume moths. They have this uh, uh, T-shape. And again, this is another one. The first time I saw my first plume moth, no idea what kind of bug that was. It, it took me a while. Like, if, if, in fact, if, I should say this, if I hadn't been standing next to Alonzo and asked him what we were looking at, I wouldn't have known it was a plume moth. Um, I think this is a pink sided fern moth. This was a really pretty one. I've only ever seen once. Uh, it's a really neat, uh, really neat, beautiful moth, really tiny. You can see the wood grain uh, of the door it's sitting on it. So hopefully that can help you see that it's not a very big moth. Um, this is Datana, D-A-T-A-N-A. -A -A. And I just, I can't look at these without thinking like it's a, a stub of a cigar with a little red uh, butt at the end that's still kind of lit. Um, and these are another uh, moth where you'll often find the uh, caterpillars uh, in an aggregation uh, and together on a plant. And if you get too close or disturb the leaf, they'll all start moving uh, to try to 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 um, you know fake you out as a, as a predator. And, and they're uh, a really neat species as well. Um, don't remember this moth, but you can see the name of this moth, but you can see the um, um, the abdomen sticking straight up. And you know these are often these poses are to help um, break up their shape or help them camouflage or look very different. I don't think this moth has a common name. I think part of the reason I can't remember it is it's just a, a Latin name. Uh, this is an ermine moth. Uh, if you know what ermine are, the white uh, weasel, they're very very pretty, uh, and that's where this one gets its name from. Um, and this is I, I think one of the prominents. I don't remember which prominent, um, but when you see this moth, it looks like a stub of stick sticking up uh, on the side of a building like this one. Uh, pretty easy to spot, uh, but on a tree or a branch, this could be a really difficult or even impossible moth to find or notice without actively, you know, actually looking for it. Uh, this is one of the looper moths. They have this really distinct shape as well, and they get really neat. Uh, and the coloration and the the spots that you'll see on the side of the lack of spots can help you identify them. But I think there's like 20 or 30 species, so they can be a little tricky to identify as well. Um, I don't remember, I think this is one of the fruit roller moths. And then this one here on the right is a vagabond crambus. Um, I'll talk more about them a little bit later, but they're a, another tiny, really slim moth that definitely don't sit with their wings out to the side. Uh, so again, one of the things I always like to point out to people is, you know, it doesn't have to be. Everybody knows about bird watching. I think birding is, is one of those those sports that transcends our interest group, and in that there are people outside of um, nature people. And I like to think we're all nature people, but you know, there are some people that really get into to nature and, and and doing things outdoors, and some people that just you know have a passing. You know, they do other stuff, and it's not really their thing. But I think most people are aware that going out and looking at birds through binoculars is, is a hobby. Uh, on some level, however much more or or less people understand about that. Um, but there are people that go out and, you know, they're looking for butterflies, they're looking for dragonflies, you know, so I always said, why not moss? Um, one of the newest hobbies I'd seen within the last five or six years is micro fishing, where people go out and they catch tiny fish, take a picture of them on their hand, and then release the fish, and they collect fish that way, much the way people collect observations of, you know, birds and butterflies, dragonflies and moths. Um, so, you know, I always like to pose this question that if you can go out and look for birds or, or dragonflies or butterflies, why not moths? Um, you know, in North America, and I, I'm going to put a big, big caveat <laughs> on this slide. 
because I was like, I should update this slide because I can't remember the last time um, I updated the slide and I started to look at these numbers uh, and I found all kinds of different numbers. So the majority of these numbers are close. I wouldn't call any of these numbers act very accurate because um, since I, I did this slide, it's probably been a few years since I did the slide, could have had extinctions, you could have had invasives move in. Um, there could be a different uh, method that some of some groups that observe these animals um, measure these numbers. So um, just think of these more as approximates, you know, the number of mammals or birds. Birds, um, this 914 birds, I think I've seen as many as 990 uh, listed in a field guide for North America, and that's still all north of Mexico. That doesn't include Mexico or any of the Central American countries, but if you actually talk about North America, Mexico is part of North America, but it often gets left out in these species counts. And I think there's an increased diversity that makes these numbers even bigger. Um, so these numbers are probably more for uh, everything north of the Mexican border. So, you know, continental US, Canada, uh, and maybe Alaska. I don't think they would include uh, Hawaii, but you got, you know, f over 470 mammals, um, nearly a thousand species of birds, about 350 reptiles, just shy of 300 amphibians. Um, I just read one of the numbers I read was closer to a thousand species of fish, and that's probably mostly freshwater. We're probably not even talking about, uh, you know, a, a marine species. Um, I think butterflies is under 800. I think that's number still holds uh, in your know, mid 400s for the number of dragonflies and damselflies put together. So there's well over 4000 total species of these critters that tend to be more people pay more attention to. But if you really want a big number, if you really want to go after a group that has a lot of numbers, take a look at those moths. You got over 11,000 moth species in North America. That means you can go out. Discover. Not to, for you, not for science, but discover for you a new species of moth every day for over 30 years if you really wanted to. There's always a, a new species out there um, and, and there's different ways to find them. We're going to talk about that in, in, in a minute here. Um, so full disclosure, went through all that, told you all about the differences between moths and butterflies. There's really not a, a lot of difference between them. Evolutionally speaking, butterflies are just day flying moths. So we're closer to 12,000 species of Lepidoptera north of, of Mexico. Um, but when you when you look at the classification, you look at Lepidoptera, there's nothing that really sticks butterflies separately from moths. Uh, they're just day flying moths. Uh, which is great, I think, because they're still there. And and again, because of the ones that we see out during the day, uh, I think they get a lot more attention than, than most of the moths. <clears throat> so hopefully by this point, you're like, wow, Ken, moths are really cool. How can I find some more moths? Um, well, you can work at a nature center in Reston, Virginia, where they leave the lights on next to the front door and they leave the lights on over on the side doors here because this is a rental space and they leave the lights on at the upper deck on the back and at the back door because there's security lights and they end up being on all night. The other thing that was really cool about I'm trying to remember my no. The other thing that was really cool about this is this was um, kind of cypress siding, so it was not smooth. It had a lot of texture and a lot of footholds. Um, and I would come in some mornings and I'd spend a full half hour going by all these lights and taking pictures of everything I saw before I even got to my desk. Uh, just the, the diversity of what was attracted to the lights was amazing. And lights are usually a really good um, way of bringing in insects. You can do many different uh, types of traps. This is a, a trap where you've got the light inside the bucket uh, and the, the uh, insects come in, they, or the moths come in, they try to get in and they end up falling in there. And a lot of times you'll see like inside these tubs, there's uh, a lot of uh, eggshells, uh, a lot of different surface for them to come out. And then um, when this is being done, I think they check these like every hour or every other hour. So they check them all through the night. Um, so it's a long night uh, on the on the right here. You can do something a little simpler. This is what I usually do for something like this. Is what I usually do for. Um, uh, my, my campfires, I set up two sheets. One, I have a, a regular uh, old light. Um, this is, there is a specific kind of light, and I just blank it on now. I think it's some kind of magnesium light uh, that tends to be better at attracting moths than just uh, the regular lights we use now. Um, it's also more expensive uh, light, and it's probably a little harder to find. I think it's like $70 a bulb, which is why I don't have one. Um, but you can do that. And then um, when I do these, 
for um, uh, my campfires, I set up uh, a sheet with a regular light and I set up a sheet with a black light. And it's just a cheapy uh, like $11 black light I got, I think in a Spencer gifts or somewhere. Um, and it's lasted for many years, which is still surprising me. Um, and so you'll get some different critters on each of those sheets where you get the black light versus the regular light. Um, so that can give you uh, some really interesting stuff. Another thing that you can do, uh, and I think to really be successful at this, you have to do it for several days to really get good results, but you can actually bait. So you're only gonna get certain species of moth that come out to these. Not every moth is gonna be attracted to this light. So sometimes what you can do is attract other species of moths to trees by um, putting something on it to bait them, something sweet. Uh, and the recipe that I remember is um, it's, a, it's a good way if you if you're if you're a beer drinker and you like beer and occasionally you have beer that's in the fridge too long and it's skunked or it doesn't taste good or it's bad. You can use old beer. So it's another way to use it and um, really, really ripe bananas and brown sugar. And you mix that all together and, and almost into like a, you know, a paste or at least a really thick liquid. Um, and, and you literally could take a brush and just paint the side of a tree. Just make, you know, some strips on that tree of this this um, really smelly, sweet stuff for them. Uh, and you do that for a couple of days. You might get some that first night, but after two or three days, you know, you, you've established that it's there. And, and you're more likely to have critters coming in, checking it out. And that'll be some moths that moths that um, tend to navigate or are more interested in finding things by scent than by sight. So that's another way to um, to get some moths in to find out. Um, so again, you know, there, you know, and, and again, this, you know, I mentioned this tongue in cheek because, you know, I worked at Nature and it's great, but if you've got anywhere that has these lights on all night uh, in the morning, you'll find moths still hanging out there and other insects as well. Um, and don't ignore the others. If you do a light trap, you know, if you're checking on things, you're going to find a lot of other cool night flying insects, uh, like caddis flies here in the upper right, uh, some, uh, one of the leaf hoppers here. Uh, this is a leaf rolling cricket. Um, this was one of the a longhorn beetle. I think it was, a, it was one of the borers. Uh, this is a manis fly, which is still, I think, one of my all time favorite things finding it. Uh, one of my all time favorite non moth insects <laughs> finding it one of these um, light traps. Uh, this is a big horse fly. And this right here is a grapevine beetle, I believe. Um, and several of these, like these uh, darker screens here, the the moth and the horsefly and, and this um, leafhopper, I think was uh, a program either at Fort C.S. Smith or at, at Potomac Overlook. Um, and they, you can get some really neat moths. You'll be surprised. We we did we do get some really good moths in some of these areas. If you can get back into an area where there's not as much light, so yours is the only light. Um, you can find some really cool critters. So you don't ignore the critters that aren't moths on the on the sheet as well. You get a lot of really interesting uh, insect life coming to your uh, to your light traps. And again, you can't ignore them during the day either. As I mentioned, you know, if you're around gardens, you can find uh, some of these critters. I've seen several kinds of, of day flying moths at uh, Kenilworth Aquatic Gardens. They got some really nice gardens there and always seem to get one or two good ones there. Uh, and again, this is that vagabond cram as I mentioned. This is a really small. Uh, moth, uh, hopefully you can see again that by the wood grain, it's not very big. If you walk through a grass field, if you walk, you know, along the edge of a field, you'll see that you, you know, just by walking, obviously you scare some insects. These crambus moths, especially the real small ones, are the ones you often see flying ahead of your feet. Like if you're in a grassy area, uh, as you walk and you disturb some insects, you'll see these tiny little moths fly ahead and they'll go around a blade of grass and just disappear. They just land on the other side of grass and they're long and slender, so it's easier for them to hide in there and they just disappear. And these are those those critters that you'll find there as well. So even during the day, you can find uh, moths in some of these areas. Uh, now, how do I identify moth? Um, I know some people get really, they're, they're okay just seeing nature and they don't have to put a name to it. And a lot of people find um, just as much value in the critter by having a name to it so they can remember it the next time they see it. Um, you know, depending on where you're at on that, um, there are a lot of really good tools for identifying moths. And and I want to say before I start this, um, I do presentations on iNaturalist and I always warn people, sometimes you're not going to get to species or you're going to get to species, but it's not going to have a common name. You know, most birds have a common name. Most reptiles and amphibians have a common name. A lot of insects don't. Um, or what you know them as is really the family name and the that that individual species may not have a common name. So you you'll be ready for that. Just like uh, I talked about that uh, geometer 
that uh, crocus geometer where it could be the crocus geometer, the false crocus geometer, but you don't know until you dissect it. Um, there are a lot that are like that. So for some of these, you just you can get the genus and that's it. Um, but hopefully it's still an experience because you get to see some really cool critters. Um, I always recommend um, and I don't get any money back. Just want to throw that out there, but I always recommend uh, field guides are, are a good way to start because to me, a field guide is a way to identify some you've seen. It's also as a kid who spent a lot of his um, October's and November's looking at Christmas catalogs. Um, to me, field guides are my new toy catalog. I look through those like I want to see that species. I want to see that species. Where do I need to go to see them? Um, now, in the old days, this is what you found in your moth field guides. You see this. Um, this is a really nice. Don't get me wrong. This is a really nice collection. It's obviously, you know, well um, curated. They got the, the the species name and the scientific name. A really nicely done, nice job of, of pinning them all. But this is not what these moths look like out in the wild. Um, and but this is what the illustrations in the old Peterson guide look like. And they're really, um, I don't know this for certain, but I look at that old guide and I feel like it was made for people that have already that are catching and killing and pinning the moths and keeping them as specimens instead of people that are seeing them out in the field. Um, the new Peterson guides to moths. There's one you can see on the left is northeastern North America, on the right is southeastern North America. And the problem is we live in both field guides because both field guides cover species you'll find in uh, Virginia. It just I, sometimes I'm I'm a sucker for just a pretty book cover, uh, and both these book covers do a nice job of illustrating the diversity of moths uh, that you can see, and, and and I really think they did a nice job and in choosing the species they did. Um, but both these books are fantastic. This is the this is the one I mentioned earlier when I saw that um, carpenter worm moth. I went out and bought this field guide and I think this it had just been published and so it was kind of a, a new field guide at the time. And since then they've published the southeastern uh, copy as well. And um, they're both just fantastic. I really love these books. They got nice illustrations and they show you the moths as you would see them out in the wild, not as you would see them in your collection where you're pinning them, if that's what you do. Um, uh, on the inside, the next couple of illustrations we see are all from the, the Northeastern Guide, but I think it's the same in the Southeastern Guide. They have, whoops. Oh, so yeah, so like I said, these moths don't, you know, they're not laying flat with the wings out to their side. They're holding them in a different position or they're holding them um, semi uh, upright or they're folding them into a cylinder. And so you don't see them the way they would be pinned. Um, and the inside of, I think this is the front of the guide or maybe it's the back, I can't remember. No, it's the back. It uh, looks like there's more pages on the left here. It's the back. These are shapes of all the different families. And so they can help you start or get an idea of where you might go. You know, if I'd had this book when I saw my first plume moth, I'd open up and like, oh, hey, that was a plume moth. Uh, if I would figured out it was a moth. Here's a tussock moth, if you remember, I, I, that's another one I showed earlier where they got those, those two front long legs that are, are out front as if to hold them there. Um, Marathissa, I think maybe that was that one I, I couldn't remember earlier. Uh, here's the looper moth, where I mentioned they have that really distinct shape. And so you got all these different groups and that can help you get a start with um, what, what does my moth look like? You know, what shape is it? And then that can get me to, all right, I got this smaller moth and it's got the, a little bit of its abdomen sticking straight up. I think it's a slug moth. So that can get you started where you're going to want to go first. Um, and also they have this diagram in with all the, they, there's a ton of terminology, but if you do it enough, you get used to the, the, the names and it's a really, really nice uh, diagrams to, to get you through all that. And even the different shapes of, uh, antennae where you know bipectinate where it's branched on both sides and pectinate where it's branched on one and filiform which is um, more um, butterfly shape than it is a uh, typical moss shape or feathery shape. Um, there are things there are places like bug guide. I'm a big fan of bug guide when it comes to insects. I will tell you this. I have put insects up on bug guide and I naturalist and gotten a different answer on each. Um, <laughs> on each platform, just like I put up um, butterflies and moths on Bug Guide and on Bamona, butterflies and moths in North America, and got a different uh, result on both too. So um, at some point, you, you might need to figure that out. But um, both these are going to be really good. I, I, I haven't done Bamona in many years. You know, if you really get into butterflies and moths, I, I recommend it. It's really interesting. It's obviously very specific. Um, I haven't done bug guide in a few years either, but I, I use bug guide a lot. I just haven't posted to it. Um, most of my posting I do now, uh, I do on iNaturalist. Um, I find iNaturalist fun. And, and the best thing is if you put something up that you think is a moth and it turns out not to be a moth, um, 
you know, Bug Guide can help you with that too, but iNaturals certainly as well. Uh, I just, I, I love iNaturals and put stuff up and see what other people have put up as well. So when you come across that really oddly shaped um, insect, like, and again, this is my first the plume moth, it can help you get there. Um, or, you know, unless you're lucky enough to be standing next to somebody who already knows what it is. Um, oh yeah, so, and I always, I always like to tell people, image search can sometimes be your best friend. Don't try to be all fancy, be like, it's a T shape, you know, it's a, it's a perpendicular um, structure, 90 degree angled insect with, um, that's, uh, you know, got all these things. Don't be, don't be fancy. That look, it's an insect that looks like a T. So I um, did this to, to prove a point. I was on Google and I wrote T-shaped bug and everything I got on the first, um, almost everything I got on the first few lines are different kinds of plume moss. And that gives you a starting point. So sometimes Google can really help you. Don't try to describe it like a scientist or a naturalist. Describe it like um, you've never seen something like that before. And what's the simplest way you could think that other people might describe it? Because that's going to get you these search results. And again, like I said, moth looks like a clownfish got me to that species at one time, which I, I, I was so happy with myself that I figured it out. Um, and so I've used this several times when I can't find any other way to figure out what it is. You know, I just it, the simplest description for, you know, if I if I was somebody that didn't know a lot about bugs or moths, how would I describe this uh, without, uh, you know, all these extra terms and how can it get me there? And a lot of times I can I can get a breakthrough or at least a, a solid lead on where I want to go uh, using just a, a Google image search. Um, so who cares about moths? Well, moths are pollinators. Uh, that can be really, really important. This is that squash vine borer again, um, so they can certainly be pollinators. Um, they can also be environmental indicators, just like when people go out and look in streams and they're looking for um, uh, macroinvertebrates. Here's a, this is a crane fly and it's a net spinner. I think it's a net spinner catalyst fly over here. Um, you know, they look for these and they count them and they can get an idea on the health of the stream. You know, the number of moths you could find in a in a forest can give you an idea of how healthy that environment is as well. Some many moths, um, their larva, their their caterpillars can be pretty specific to to several species or one species. And if you don't have that species, you won't have that moth. And so a diversity of moths in an area can tell you uh, about the health of that uh, that ecosystem, that forest system. Um, this is again, this is rest in that the nature center showed you earlier, you know, several, um, I forget how many I got up to, but I think I got close to 200 species of moths seen on and around that nature center. And it was, I think it was a testament to how healthy that little patch of woods was. Um, I think the last time I checked, I'm, I'm over 150 species of moths and butterflies in, uh, Arlington in and around Arlington as well, you know, so it, it can be an indicator of the health of that species because again, the, you know, not all these critters are using the same plants. Uh, and so when you get a diversity of plants and, and trees, um, you get a diversity of, of these guys as well. And they can have an economic impact. This is a mealworm moth that uh, can be a pest on food stores for humans. Uh, this is a lesser, yeah, lesser waxworm lesser wax moth, which can be really destructive in uh, beehives. This one was in the beehive we used to have at the Nature Center and between these guys and <clears throat> um, hive beetles, we, we just weren't able to keep a healthy uh, beehive uh, the last few years for whatever reason. Uh, but we see these a lot and um, they can be a really big pest in some other areas. I don't know how big they are around here, but we used to see them almost every year in our beehive at some point uh, and they're and it's not so much the adult the adults just looking to lay an egg but the larva will destroy honeycomb and just move through and eat and eat and just uh, make a real mess inside of a beehive um, and then if you were if you remember the old cartoons like i do where somebody pull out a wallet to show they didn't have any money moths would fly out of it and um you know the the old idea that you could you know you Go look at old clothes and moths would come out of the box. Um, there is a species that would feed on old clothes and old fabrics, and that is this species. Uh, and this is more of a European species, but I think it's it's definitely introduced in the, the US as well, although I don't know how um, uh, how often you find them. But when you know when you see um, you know when people sell mothballs or if you've ever used mothballs or had that smell, this is the the insect they were trying to um, keep out of their, their storage area when they use mothballs. Uh, and a few life history notes on the on the tail end of the um, 
program here and I just want to talk about it. You know, when you when you look at a group like this, you know, you're like, yeah, they you know they lay an egg and out comes a caterpillar and eats the plants, and then it metamorphoses into moth, and that's it. And some of them have some really interesting life histories. Um Luna moths only live about a uh, a week after they emerge as an adult. They don't eat. You know, they're using energy that they accumulated as a caterpillar and their job at this point pretty much is to to mate and uh lay eggs and that's it. So when you do get to see uh, a luna moth it, it, it's pretty neat because you're you're catching that luna moth in the one week that it's an adult for its entire life um so that's you know a, a pretty nice chance encounter because you know you can't depend on that moth to be back in a month or or even the, the following week um so i always get excited when i see them because they know how um small that window is to actually see one of these critters um and obviously uh predation there's a lot of critters that eat um butterflies and moths and they can be an important part of food chains in that way and sometimes you never see the moth but uh i know it was there this was again uh, on the the upper deck there beneath the the um beneath one of the lights at that the, the nature center resting so not only did i know where to look for the critters but so did some of the predators uh, this is a harvester um there are a very small number i think less than one percent of uh, lepidopter um have um are carnivorous or at least like you know life stage and this um is the only butterfly in north america that has carnivorous larva that will eat aphids and small insects so each of these uh caterpillars here are actually you know trying to eat these aphids here that's their food uh and again that's the harvester butterfly i've only ever seen this butterfly once uh this was in a parking lot at westmoreland state park during a a bird trip i was leading i was super excited I didn't know what it was, but it was an orange butterfly and I took a picture and found out later what it was and it was even more um, happy. But again, that was really far away to for that picture to to come through. Um, and parasitism, big role, as I, I mentioned and showed this uh, chrysalis earlier. Um, several different types of caterpillars are susceptible to pecan and wasp. That's what these cocoons are. The pecan and wasp find the caterpillar, sting it, um, and when they sting it, they're they release their eggs inside the caterpillar. The eggs hatch, the larvae eat the tissues inside the caterpillar, but often avoid um, the major organs so the caterpillar doesn't die immediately um, and lives long enough for the, um, uh, the larva to eat their fill, come back out through the exoskeleton of the uh, caterpillar and form a cocoon where they pupate into adults. Um, and I see this pretty regularly on our um, Catalpa moth, uh, Catalpa sphinx moth caterpillars, uh, and our Catalpa, you can come out probably any time now and start and, and see the caterpillars, but also see some of the caterpillars just covered with these cocoons. Um, and I, I can't remember how many years ago, but I remember looking at them once with Jen Souls two or three years ago, and we actually got to see a couple of the wasps come out while we we're watching them, which is really neat. Uh, not for the caterpillars. The caterpillars always die. So the parasites, you know, when you say parasite, usually that implies that they're feeding off a host, but they don't kill the host. Parasitoids, which is what these pecan and wasps are, uh, eventually kill the host. They're they're um, uh, feeding on the host. Eventually, leads to the host's demise. Um, so the, this this caterpillar is never going to metamorphose into uh, an adult. Um, this is. I literally added this at like 7.59 tonight, but I found this cool. This is Calyptra, which is the genus. It's a it's a vampire moth, um, and they are, I think, the only moth known to to occasionally feed on vertebrate blood, and they can actually pierce our skin with their mouth parts. And I thought that was really neat, and uh, hopefully some of you would think that's neat and want to check it out some more. Um, but I, you know, there are, uh, this is, I was looking up that harvester, butterfly and I just happened to stumble across this. I don't know if they're in our, our area, but I think there are some species in North America, which is really neat. And there are several many species around the world. Uh, and I don't think they're um uh really a, a physical threat to our well being if they do end up feeding on our blood. I think it's very new probably much less of an impact than any than something like a tick or a mosquito. Uh, and of course self defense camouflage is always good. A lot of these moths um, really, really have really good coloration for hiding on uh, uh, tree bark and other natural areas. Um, they, some also have coloration that makes them look like a, a bigger predator. They got these eye spots. This one is really dramatic. I think this is a it's one of the swallowtails. I want to think it's a pipe vine, but I might be incorrect. Uh, but this one was spotted at uh, Huntley Meadows. That was a really pretty one. 
and it's about uh, and some you can have this cryptic coloration if that doesn't work and you still get spotted by uh, a predator. Um, these are underwing moths. They can move their front wings aside and they have this bold coloration underneath that's hopefully, you know, it's meant to possibly startle a um, um, a predator and give them a chance to get away before the predator can, you know, react and, and take a bite out of the moth. Uh, and again, you could look like something undesirable. On the right is Schlager's fruit worm, uh, fruit worm moth. And on the right, I think this is a wood nymph or a wood beauty. I can't remember which, but they both look kind of like um, bird droppings. T to be fair, this is a to be a beautiful moth. And even though it kind of has that bird dropping look, it's like the prettiest bird droppings I've ever seen. Um, but I really, really like this moth. It's a, it's a really pretty one. I've only seen that one once or twice as well. Um, and you could have some spines. You know, you just be like, I don't want to be touched. And if you touch me, it's going to really hurt. Um, and I have never been stung by this one. But as I understand that Saddleback Caterpillar is one of is a really, really painful uh, sting. And you can get envenomated from um, brushing up against these spines and definitely don't recommend it. Uh, it can be really painful, painful sting. Um, one of the neatest stories, this is Cryptosis, Cryptosis colopi. I don't know if I said it right. Um, this moth. Uh, lives in the fur of sloths, of three-toed sloths. When the sloth comes down the tree once a week to uh, defecate, the moth lays eggs in the, the um, sloth's poop. The larvae hatch and feed on the poop and um, will sometimes uh, spin a web to catch other food. Uh, and then eventually they metamorphose into adults and they fly up into a new moth, uh, sloth's uh, fur, and that's where they live. Um, the it's thought that the droppings from the moths uh, um, add nitrogen into <clears throat> the little uh, microbiome of the excuse me sauce fur because uh, the sauce fur also often has algae growing on it and so it's, it, it's thought that nitrogen from the feces of the moths will enrich the growth of the algae uh, which helps then camouflage the sloth and in turn the sloth is obviously a, a big critter that uh, the moths can live on and they can avoid um, predation because they're on a bigger critter that keeps their predators away. Uh, so this is a really neat, um, really neat adaptation. And again, we don't have any sloths around here. This one's definitely not in Virginia, but I thought it was a really neat moth story. Uh, and the evergreen bagworm moth, the female never leaves here. Um, in fact, she lives and dies in this case she makes. She starts by um, you know, spinning web and attaching her own feces and eventually gets to using some bigger pieces, uh, but the male um, we'll find her through scent. We'll actually mate with her through the opening at the bottom of um, this cocoon, uh, and then she will lay eggs inside here and eventually die, and the young will hatch uh, and drop out of the opening and go start their own, uh, either, you know, uh, develop into the males, which are winged, or uh, the females, which are not, and then the females will start their own cocoon and go on uh, in the same uh, life cycle. So you really need, and again, this is, looks like, I think this is just, you know, an Eastern red cedar. Uh, if you've got red cedar anywhere around, these are often very common on them. So it's something to, to keep an eye out for. Uh, and this is what the female inside looks like. like I said, she, um, I don't think ever leaves that nest and she's not flighted like the males. Um, uh, I think that's the male that's flighted there, but there's also the fall cankerworm moth. This is a male and the female also not flighted. Uh, and so she releases pheromones, which the male will follow to find her in order to mate and uh, make more little fall cankerworm moths. So there's lots of really interesting um, natural history stories that you can get out of these um, uh, out of these moths, and they're they're really I think worth uh, a, a look around. So um, I don't know if anybody has any questions, um, but uh, that is my presentation, and I'm happy to chat with you or answer any questions that you might have. And thanks for joining me again in case you decide to leave before I get to say that. Thank you, Thank very, you much. very much. No problem. Thanks for joining me. Boy, I should... oh, delightful talk. Great imagery. Thank you. Oh, th uh, thank you. I like to take a lot of uh, pictures. Ken, I just wanted to put a plug out for Matt Felpern for tomorrow night. Can yeah, I go ahead and say that there's going to be a live viewing? 
Um, hi, all. Stella Tarney from Capital Nature, and I'm so thrilled that Ken was inspired to do this. Um, and similarly inspired kind of at the last minute, or not quite last minute, was Matt Felpern and my colleague Anna Kahanui. They'll be doing a sheet and blacklight viewing at Potomac Overlook Park uh, tomorrow night, actually, from 9 to 1030. So uh, feel free to join them and you can sign up. Um, trying to figure out i think best way to sign up is if you go to the capital nature calendar for tomorrow and you can find the event there and i, I recommend it. it's a Thanks, great Ken. spot i did a sure sure yeah. i did a um a, a viewing there with uh, uh, a different gentleman a, a few years ago i think it was uh an nai event that uh, alonzo led um and that area is just really really good for you know there's not a lot of light pollution and so you can really get some attention on your light trap and it was really good and it was a lot of really neat critters so there are a couple questions in the chat ken but i'll just ask mine of sure. you which is that i i live in virginia but i was walking around in north carolina last night and i saw oh. all these little little what look like little sticks all around the edge of a metal sign and then i realized thanks to iNaturalist that they were those little bag worms and i was kind yeah. of blown away and you talked about them and I just I can't quite picture how a female moth can no. can gather small sticks, I'm gonna, I'm gonna just break them up, and, and, and make them that thing. Yeah, yeah. and, and, and I, I don't know how they do it either. Uh, you know, I don't have um, I don't have quite the um, uh, experience with that. Um, but obviously, you know, the, the female's not flighted, and so. Uh, I think uh, it might part of it might be while they're in their larval stage, or maybe they don't quite metamorphose uh, as dramatically from the um, the larva through pupa to adult, uh, because obviously they're not flighted and they don't change. Most insects, um, and the, excuse me, the only exception I can think of is uh, is mayflies, but most insects don't mate uh, don't molt again once they have wings. And that's when their section mature, and that's it. Molting's do done because molting with wings can be really difficult. Um, but maybe, yeah, I don't know. I'd have to look that one up. I, I I don't know. I've always wondered, how, like you said, how they um, they accomplish that. But because again, you know, birds can build these really complex nests, nests, and all they have is a beak and feet. Um, but how yeah. these um, these larval or non flying moths do that, I don't know. And then you know where why they choose where they end up is, is a mystery to me as well. Um, but it's fascinating because I, I do I see them on a lot of different surfaces. Yeah, it's crazy, right? Because it's tons of tiny little sticks. And like yep. in this case, it's a, you know, it's a 10 foot tall signpost that they presumably had to crawl up and down carrying them in their mouth or what? I don't know. It's just really crazy, right? Now, to, to, be, to be fair, I, I always like to point out to people, they don't have Netflix, among other things. So there's not a lot else for them to do. So that journey, which seems long and, and tedious for us, they don't have really th anything else to do. So that's, you know, their purpose is to to get where they need to be to reproduce and, and make sure that there's more young um, the next time around. Um, but yeah, it, 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 I mean, it's just a journey and, you know, it's such a small critter and see them do it. Um, I, I did an invertebrate camp for two weeks, um, uh, the last two weeks of June, uh, the two weeks prior to 4th of July. And on one of our trips out to the pollinator garden, we found this little critter. It, and all I could think of was like a terrestrial caddisfly, which I, I don't I don't think is a thing, but it was like this little larva and it was carrying this case it had made. And it was like conical, but it was not sticks. It wasn't anything that looked like one of those bagworms, but it probably more than likely was. And it was just, you know, it was moving across this railing and I'd never seen anything like it before. It was really neat. Um, and again, all these questions like, you know, what are you using to attach that to yourself? How do you do it? Um, and, and another critter that does something similar is uh, lace wings. Lace wings have these larvae that are a little car uh, very carnivorous, and often there are some species that don't cover themselves, and there's others that do. And again, just like the the bag worm, they start with a little bit of silk in their own feces, and eventually move on to little stuff. But if you ever see like a little puff, looks like a little powder power, yeah, powder puff, just walking around on a leaf. There's a lace wing larva under there attached to that, and they use all that debris on their back to hide from uh, predators. Are there any moths that pollinate Rudbeckia? I just noticed that one. Um, probably. I, I don't know off the top of my head, um, but my guess is it probably is. Um, Rudbeckia, I think, is brown-eyed Susan. Is that right? Um, uh, plants that look like that. Um, moths, I don't know. Certainly, probably butterflies. But I don't know about moths. That's interesting. Um, button bush is another good one. 
is, is a good one to look for mods on because um, again, a lot of mods are uh, uh, nocturnal. And so flowers that stay open at night are obviously more likely to be pollinated by a moth. So uh, button bush is a really good one because those flowers stay open all night. Uh, yucca is another one that's pollinated by moths and very specifically by yucca moths. Um, but yeah, I don't know off the top of my head any moths that might pollinate uh, Rudbeckia. I have to look that one up. Uh, thank you for the wonderful comments, by the way, everybody in the chat. Uh, does anybody have any other questions that they'd like to ask? Well, thank you for joining me then. I am uh, I'm going to head out and uh, stop the recording and you all have a, a wonderful night and I probably won't talk or see you before then. So have a great weekend as well. Uh, thanks for joining me tonight and have a good one. Thank you. Great talk.